Okay, so um, my first question is directed to you, Cray. Um, so, uh, Descendants of the Yuna Admiral is a very well-known play by Ko Pao Kun. It was first staged in English in 1995, um, directed by Wong King Sen with Theatre Works, and then later by Ko Pao Kun himself, a few months later with Theatre Practice in Mandarin. So, it's often been read as a play that has to deal with, um, that deals with uh, historical and geographical displacements and the kind of like cultural um, and identity fragmentation that comes about um, because of this displacement. So what was it particularly about this play that drew you um, to choose it as a key text uh, in your response to Tao Fei's work? I think, <clears throat> I think firstly, uh, Ko Pakun has always been a very big influence in my practice. I think if you recall in my very early video, um, the, the title of the work is directly referencing uh, Ko Pao Kun's ex, um, The Coffin's Too Big for the Hole. So I think um, I've always read his play and I've always felt like I connected to a lot of the sort of sentiments that he was expressing with uh, the kind of narrative and conceptual premise that he set. Um, and then when I first saw Tao Fei's um, work at the rooftop and um, it was almost instantaneous that I, I thought about Descendants um, because of the motif of the ship. So you've described this play and as, as an abridgment or an adaptation. So could you speak more about which parts of the play you chose to focus on and um, what themes um, in these parts of the play resonated most with you? Um, I think the 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 play is quite uh, convoluted. Like it, it sort of um, jumps between various uh, mental states and various uh, narrative lines. So for me, I think uh, in order for me to do something more visual, more audio, uh, I really had to cut down the amount of text within the play. Uh, so for me, I wanted to uh, focus more on the main pointers such as the notion or rather the metaphor of uh, the castrated man or um, the fact that um, Zheng He has become such a <clears throat> sort of legendary figure in, um, in, in a lot of his um, mythologies that we, we come to understand and are very familiar with. And I think also for me on a sort of larger premise I started to investigate this idea of the uh, Chinese identity a lot more recently, uh, especially with uh, the rise of um, China. Um, so for me, it was really a moment that I thought would be very interesting um, to revisit the play in relation to the work. And um, it coincided with this uh, sort of interest in understanding how to think about the Chinese identity now that um, you know, like it, uh, that this this notion of the ethnic Chinese is becoming more and more challenged and more and more uh, blurred. In terms of, you know, reading this play that was produced in 1995 um, in relation to this work uh, by Cao Fei Fu Cha that was made in 2020, um, there's actually a gap of almost more than two decades. So I was also wondering how reading it today, you know, uh, in this time, in this, in this kind of economic climate, uh, changes or kind of reinscribes this play by Kuo Pao Kun with a different significance, if any. Maybe in many ways, we haven't really moved much since 20 years ago. I think like the sort of <clears throat> discussions that we have around here uh, somehow still surround the notions of censorship or still somehow surround the notions of um, not being able to be uh, to fully express ourselves right so I think um, for me right now when I think about these ideas it does bring in newer sort of uh, dynamics that is happening today such as the right the, such as the, the idea of having the internet as a platform for, uh, for, for discussion, for, for discourse. So I think with the internet, it brings new, new forms of castration, new forms of how we are policing our thoughts, how we are changing the way we talk, the way we express certain ideas. So I think for me, um, that was one of the more uh, sort of significant 
uh, ways I think I, I want to revisit the play. Mm. So directing this to um, both Leslie and Tai Ying, how did um, this play resonate with you particularly in terms of like, your parts as well as the roles that you played in it? Maybe Leslie can start. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I first met Cray and then he basically heard his point of view on, on how this is going to go, I mean, being like born and raised here and, you know, living through the times and getting to this point, <clears throat> you definitely feel all these emotions. And I connected immediately to, to what he was talking about, you know, and with, with the, the play as well, Pop Alpun's play. I think that was what kind of drew me in, you know, having kind of like, you know, the music scene owes a lot to Substation and Kopal Kun and all that. So everyone's kind of linked somewhat. And it kind of, uh, yeah, just kind of touched the nerve. So that's what drew me in. Yeah. 我其实我出生在厦门人我们一直在不知道自己要去哪里一直在移居吧可以这么说但是同时之间又觉得其实这个里面是有一种力量在里面的但那个力量是很难用语言去形容的 yeah. right, So, you know, all these themes that all of you have brought up really um, lend themselves well to this kind of broad interpretation because the play itself is a very um, loose in terms of its structure they're just like 16 chapters and there's no it's well known for having no stage directions or even no characters so um, how did you uh, conceive of these characters and kind of like uh, decide that they were abridgment uh, would feature three parts um, perhaps Kray can start and then each of you can kind of respond to how you interpreted your respective parts um so for me, I, I was, the, the process was much more uh, interior in nature in the sense that I was really looking at how uh, even uh, within myself, I already felt quite fragmented with trying to uh, uh, reconcile with the various sort of identities that I have to put up on, on the everyday basis. So I think uh, when I conceive of these characters, it was... Uh, in a way, sort of representations of these moments that I felt. When I think of using the various texts in the play, uh, it was more about, okay, how can I um, either interpret these portions myself or can I uh, sort of pass it on to my various collaborators um, to, to uh, translate into a different form. So I think um, to answer your question, it, it's sort of loosely based on that, but um, not so uh, defined in that sense. And, and I think once I found uh, the two of them, it was also quite reassuring on my end because I, I really trust um, their aesthetics. I, 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 I heard Leslie's songs a lot of times before I uh, reached out to him. And then I actually worked with Tai Ying before when we were on this uh, residency in Philippines. So I think um, it was a lot about this sort of uh, trust that I have with them as well that I can, I can um, in a way, allow their own sort of artistic practice and character to come through. And I, I, I know that we, the three of us together will be quite aligned with each other. Yeah. 
Uh, um, do the roles um, kind of overlap each other or do they change as the work unfolds? I think the the changing of the characters is something I think uh, was conceived by me at the beginning whereby uh, coming from a sort of uh, narrative point of view, you know, uh, I would want to think of some form of uh, transformation in, in the characters. So, uh, but of course, this, this transformation is not uh, happening on a, on a narrative level, but it can happen on a sort of formal and a sort of visual or audio manner. So, I think like uh, a direction I gave to Leslie, for example, would be that maybe we can think of using acoustic sounds in the beginning and then eventually becoming more and more distorted and more and more uh, sort of uh, uh, inclu- including effects and including uh, more digitized sounds. So I think it really started with this sort of uh, initial premise, initial uh, uh, concepts. And uh, it was not meant to. Uh, it was not meant to dictate a certain uh, 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 way the character transform. One of the rules uh, is that I want um, the three of us to to sort of undo something that we normally uh, always do. We are we are good at doing. So I think when I when I. Uh, conceive of Tsai rule, for example. I, I know she's a very uh, trained uh, contemporary dancer. And um, in fact, when I first approached her, I, I told her, I want to cast you as an opera sort of performer, opera singer. And, and I told her that, okay, we can do some kind of uh, workshop with a professional opera artist, and then we can we can do the translations of the of the um, text into something more uh, lyrical, into something more melodic, on our own. But I think generally it comes from your sort of understanding of movement and, and dance. And yeah, that was that was the way uh, it has been conceived. And then um, for. For Leslie, I think it was more about uh, putting him into more, say, uh, unfamiliar territory of speaking in Mandarin, for example, or like uh, to be part of the 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 scenes that are not uh, about singing or about the songs, but as part of the the greater um, visual uh, uh, flow that was happening. So, like. Uh, even with the songs, he had to perform some kind of actions with the song. Yeah. Actually, um, when you talk about this idea of fragments, I think it really speaks to the way that Guo Pao Kun has structured the play, where you are coming into contact with a different sense of narration, and it's not necessarily a linear story told from one perspective. And hence, you know, that's why I feel it's also really fantastic that you brought Leslie and Tsai Ying on because then it, it speaks to that fragmentation, which is also not about necessarily um, a fragmentation of one story, but the fact that fragments from different stories and actually different mediums can also unfold, you know, in one piece of work. Yeah. Yeah. So if Leslie, you would also be interested to share, I think, about whether, you know, how, how you responded to this primary material of Kuo Pao Kun's play? I think, I mean, the, the role was already kind of defined when, mm-hmm. when, we, when I was first met with Cray and, and the idea of the mood and, and I mean, I had a feeling that, you know, I just needed to do what I do and it would kind of be, would be roughly in the ballpark. So it gave me that kind of freedom. Like you just do what you con- what you normally do, and the emotion would come out of it. You know, like so. I just did exactly that. Read the play and just uh, I kind of use the Pao Kun's words as kind of like the word <laughs> sort of thing, and just kind of crafted music out of it. Mm. In that sense, I, I kind of followed it pretty closely as much as possible. We kind of zeroed in on 
which were the important texts as well. So there were other versions as well, but those didn't make the cut. But ultimately, what you all hear is the the best bits. I I felt yeah, we kind of narrowed in on the best bits, and yeah. So for me, it was just really I was like following crazed vision in that sense, and just trying to get some emotion out of mm. it, out of the text of mm. Paukun. And with regards to the lyrics, it's kind of a luxury to, to work with lyrics sometimes. Then I don't really need to draw from my own personal experiences. And, and, and most of my songs are pretty much about like, like uh, issues of the heart, of, of, the, you know, of life, basically. So this time around, it was more just seeing Pao Kun's words, although it may seem like he was projecting himself somewhat, but he was also seeing a lot of what he was feeling in being in Singapore. And, and for someone several generations later reading something like that, I mean, it feels good to know that, 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 that there were people out there, you know, saying something about our, I mean, life here, you know, and it's always nice. I mean, like for me, it's always like people like Chris Ho and <laughs> in the music scene, and we, we looked up to people like that. And my introduction to like other disciplines in terms of like uh, theater and all that, I would say I've come across Kopa Kun's work quite many times. I mean, it, I think everyone always goes back to him. So it was nice to work with his lyrics and um, yeah, I think the, the experience was was uh, just like I said earlier, it was kind of very comfortable and very easy to get to that point uh, because possibly all of us feel the things that he's saying and can relate. <laughs> I think that's, that's one of the things, the main thing. Um, maybe I just interject here a bit. So, uh, in, in a sense, when I, f I re first looked for them, it was, in a way, of already a form of uh, casting. So, uh, it's, to, to come back to your question about the rules, so in, in a sense, it, there is some some kind of direction there already, but it was more of a, a starting point and then just sort of letting it go afterwards. Yeah. Okay, so before we kind of move on to the next section, I'd like to ask about a very specific quality of this work. I mean, the fact that we are actually recording this artist talk now instead of doing it live speaks to the change that the world has experienced with this pandemic. So originally, it was meant to be a performance, and I think that um, both um, Tai Tai and Nesti and uh, are I mean, performance in a live setting is very something you're very accustomed to. And then, Cray, you always use performance in your videos. So what actually changed um, from the original conception of this work to the form that it now takes as a kind of video work? I have never done something live before. So I think uh, when uh, NGS first approached me about doing a response to uh, Tao Fei, the most immediate intuition was to let's let me try something live and I think of course at that moment it was uh, I, I don't think we all anticipated the scale of uh, work being put into this I, uh, this project so it was really more of thinking about something that I can experiment with uh, of course together with music and together with movement um, and how I can sort of find ways to translate this video uh, visual ideas into something live um, and with the whole situation and when um, I was proposed to think about how I can um, convert it to video then and I think naturally the, the idea of producing a video I, I, I put on the video making head almost immediately then it that, that, that more free and experimental uh, nature of the performance just kind of collapsed into a more structured uh, approach to the whole uh, project, yeah. So I think it really then went from 
uh, I think at the beginning, we really didn't know what we were doing. I only know like I had this very awesome track to uh, play with, and it was about then um, sort of directing how each track can come in and what sort of uh, events can unfold with the track. Um, to this, whereby I really had to revisit the the Kopaku script and to think of them as like script for a short film and how I can visualize scene by scene, line by line. So I would say it's two totally different sort of approaches. And and I don't think like whatever I did before the video idea came about was sort of wasted. It, it definitely started with the kind of experimental spirit, which I think still uh, that the video still shows in a sense that it's something that um, as, as, as polished or as structured as it seems it, it, it is something that I have not tried before and I, I wanted to try yeah so Tsaying, um, what, what kind of like um, how did working with Cray push you in different directions based on your own background in terms of Chinese dance as well as uh, contemporary choreography and modern dance I think this is something that made me 嗯，在这个创作过程中的一个很其中一个很实在的收获，就是跟呃，Cray他介绍了一位啊，一个戏曲的老师，然后给我握手，然后学他的身段，然后他怎么去，其实那个戏曲。并不是他怎么唱而是一个架势一个而且是男生不是戏曲里面的女生是男生的那样一个架势那个气势那个状态所以我觉得对我来说是很有营养的一件事情在整个创作过程里面然后因为我的背景之前的背景是中国舞但又有一样可是又不太一样所以我觉得这个很好玩的是有一点像这个剧本里面想在探索的一个东西就是你像那个东西但又不太像那个东西那到底真的留在我们身上的是什么东西可能是我
And I think even a lot of times, I would think that the sort of early identities that I, I took on was more, in fact, more Teochew than, than Chinese. So I just thought it was quite an interesting moment that this sort of memory started reoccurring today and what all these coincidences mean. Um, so I think by including so-called these dialects into the play it was it was more of a sort of it was both personal and also almost political kind of gesture in trying to um, understand or trying to reconnect with what it means that each of us we hold this we hold all these languages we hold all this meaning we hold these memories about being coming from a certain tribe or coming from a certain subgroup of people and and where does where can we take this um, sort of memory to in, in today's context yeah thanks Kri. um I mean I think you speak of a very um, interesting I guess phenomenon in Singapore where um, you know under the so-called Chinese diasporic umbrella. There are many actually different subgroups, but perhaps in an interest of national alignments, a lot of these subgroups have been kind of um, standardized, you know, to be a broad Chinese group. And I would like to read this uh, in contrast with uh, Tsai ing experience, um, having come from Xiamen and then traveled to so many different places outside of Singapore, and then now having been in Singapore for the last few years, you know, how, how do you feel like, you know, your experience of this broader kind of Chineseness takes root? And also how does your character kind of also speak to those kind of m much finer, I think, gradations of what it means to be Chinese? Actually, <laughs> 从北京毕业以后北京舞蹈学院毕业以后我不是很想做舞者 后来以后又去读我的MFA 因为其实舞的中国舞如果我们说中国舞它只是因为它在那个特定的审美规范里面它就是那样子的一个像我们说话它就是那样的一个韵律它就是有这么一个韵律所以它才是中国舞如果不那么做它就不是那个审美也不在
但是它，我觉得它是一个可以用来沟通的工具。对，我这么想的。Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because I believe that Kofa Kun himself wrestled with this question in many of his plays because the question is about whether diversity in terms of like different languages, different practices lead to real pluralism in terms of like what the audience、um, is experiencing as they look at this、um, scene unfolding on stage or what the actors are themselves are trying to you know like、uh, communicate. You know. So you know, we when we were speaking about this work, I think that created. We had discussed about whether we needed to put、um, subtitles on some of the parts which were not necessarily、um, uh, legible for、um, a general audience, which we presume is English.、Um, so,、um, could you share your thoughts a little bit about this process and what do you think that does for the play or doesn't do for the play?、Um. So I think maybe to add on to Tai Ying's, maybe she was using the word "tool,"、mm. but maybe I'll use the word "language." So、mm. even、um, how do we think about sort of merging between, say, the language of contemporary movements with the movements of Chinese opera? How do we、um, like for me to think about、um, a visual language? Translating a sort of theatre piece, or, or a piece at least more associated with theatre practices, and then doing this in a very almost cinematic film-like manner. So that in itself, for me, it was already、uh, a very exciting sort of premise to work with.、Um, so then, it was really important to think about these ideas of. How I can, or, or rather, where does the translation happen? Does the translation happen on screen for the viewer? Does the translation happen、uh, with me as the director of it, or maybe in、uh, Guo Bao Kun's script, the translation was already there? So then, I mean, to be honest, I haven't really quite wrapped my mind around this whole、uh, sort of questions.、Um, But I'm definitely more inclined to、uh, not have too many subtitles. I think at certain portions the subtitles、uh, maybe are needed to provide、uh, accessibility、uh, to the viewer. But maybe at certain portions I would perhaps、uh, exclude it just because this、um, sense of being able to observe or being able to to look at something. Without having to understand it, can be quite an important experience as well.、Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a really naughty question because I'm also thinking of like plays like Mama Looking for a Cat, where basically characters talk to each other in different languages and it's never translated. But you know, at the same time, we have to think about accessibility and so on. And also, I noticed that Leslie, you're an exceptionally clear singer. Like you can hear every single word that、mm-hmm. you're saying, <laughs> which is which I think leads to another kind of legibility that. It's as clear as when Cray is typing words like on the screen, so you can read it. But then when Tai Ying will come on, so it's a different kind of、um, process again because what you're performing when you're in character as the opera、um, singer, it's like a mix of different kinds of dialects. So that and that's another layer. But then at the same time, when you are expressing the emotions, it's very very legible on many many levels. So it can be, I think that the viewers almost brought into this like roller coaster of different kinds of forms and how. They communicate、um, on a very universal level as well as a specific、um, level. So that's what I found quite interesting about the video.、Mm. I think, in a way, when when I was thinking about these ideas, so it, the, the the idea of creating something that can be sort of universally uh, uh, received is is quite important as well. Like, so I think coming back to the idea of having subtitle, can I present this scene? Uh, in in sort of a foreign、uh, language, even foreign to us. So, like, in the process of converting his words into Hokkien or Teochew, for example, we we have to like find this magical app that translated word by word. And then、uh, I'm not so sure about the process for Tai Ying, but for me, sometimes the、um, the translation in in written form, or at least the pronunciation in written form, is very different from say the the local vernacular. So then, when I read it, I was like, 
I don't quite understand what I'm reading. But then if I were to swap out certain pronunciation of certain words in a much more uh, literally quite simplified words, then it sounds comfortable or at least reassuring that, okay, I, I at least understand what I am speaking. So I think this whole process, um, it, was, it was interesting. And, and I don't know whether I can sort of deliver these, uh, these experiences to the viewer as well or would I actually alienate them. So I think uh, I'm, it's still something that I want to explore a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I think really building on this idea of translation, I think, you know, enfolding in um, Leslie's kind of involvement, um, then I think really also adds a different layer because I think music is always seen as something that is not necessarily verbal, but it's also an intuitive and kind of effective process. Um, so I think in terms of what uh, Leslie brought uh, to the to the entire kind of production was also something that I wanted to ask ask you more about um, because there are many different kind of emotional registers that are happening and are being articulated in Ko Pao Kun's play and also from Cray's um, kind of collaborative selection of it with you but you know if you were to kind of pinpoint a certain register that you focused more attention on when you were composing the ambient sound for the production. You know what? What would that? What would that kind of register be? When you say register, do you mean like, like on an abstract kind of emotive oh, level? Emotive. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, like, I guess for me, like uh, when we first started, I just like did like some versions, and but then later. I mean, I'm just running you through my, the, the process that we went through. So initially it was supposed to be a live thing and, and the piece on the rooftop actually has a loop piece of music that goes throughout. So when we found, that, uh, found out that that piece of music was going to be there, we, I started to play with register in the audio mm. sense. Yeah, yeah. So I started to play around with pitches. So I changed the key of the music and all that, and but you know some some of it fit, some some really didn't. I I felt like some of the higher register uh, versions didn't really work so well with me. So so when actually the when COVID happened and everything, and the whole thing changed to video. I mean, I I, I remember telling you that I kind of in a way works to our, our advantage slightly, mm. so I have more freedom to play with the pitch, the key of the song, basically. So I, I was able to at least go for what I felt the words uh, would sound all right with me singing it, with, you know, so not cringe-worthy. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to, you know, some of the words are pretty, could be cringe-worthy, you know, so I hope I try to stay clear of that. So in terms of emotion, I think it plays a part in that sense, trying to get the emotion of not going too dramatic or, you know, yeah. or underplaying or whatever, but just to write that middle ground just to get the emotion across. Hopefully, yeah, I was able to do that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up the work um, on the roof that was uh, the sound piece that was incorporated into, into your composing because um, for Taufei's rooftop work, she worked with this composer based in Shanghai called Safka Chang Anting. And um, because it's meant to be seen in the round, she used sound to suggest a kind of universe that was beyond the rooftop or even beyond the central gallery area that the installation is located on. So at the different viewing points where you um, kind of look at the work or when you move towards or move away from the work, um, it's kind of meant to create that kind of um, like a, a literal kind of soundscape. So um, when you were composing for, for this piece, Leslie, like there, was, there were different kinds of um, um, key um, pieces like uh, the Descendants uh, song or you know, the the swelling effects or um, the the Admiral Chung her kind of a ballad, right? So what kind of um, universe will you try to compose and 
um, how did that relate to some of the more pronounced sound effects throughout, like crazy typing, for instance? Like, what, what was your thought process behind that? Mm. Like for the effects bits, it was uh, I think when when Cree first a- approached, and I remember him saying that you know it's kind of like a sci-fi, <laughs> yeah, that sci-fi thing, mm. you know. So I I always that that was at the back of my mind always. Okay, at some point in the piece, you know, I I could do sounds like that, the guitar, mm. with with run through some effects and. All that. So I think that's how that came about, uh, the effects for, for his typing in certain sections of the, 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 the piece. As for, what, what was the other? You know, like um, how you kind of conceive the entire soundscape or the, the universe of okay. the piece, yeah. Uh, kind, kind of took the easy way out, I guess, me on a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what I'm familiar with, uh, I mean, I just use that as a starting point. And also, in a way, it maybe works to the advantage of this piece because when we first started, we, we had these soundscapes that were created already for, for, for the rooftop work. And having something organic like an acoustic guitar or electric guitar uh, could be a nice blend if, if it were to coexist, you know. And so in a way, it's also something that, you know, when you hear, you don't think much about it. It's a voice and a guitar. You hear that all the time. Mm. So perhaps it's the best way to, you know, not call attention mm. to the, the sound, the sound space, soundscape. Yeah. Mm. And hopefully draw people in to the words. I mean, it is kind of an effective way it's for, for since, since folk music, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So yeah, I guess that's why I thought great. You know, it works with what he was going for, so I stuck to it. So right at the end, um, there's a lot of like a cacophony of voices overlapping and so on. So, um, Cray, what was your thinking behind um, having the conclusion take this kind of um, form? Um, I guess I think. Uh, I, I don't have a definite answer to that because I think it's a mixture of decisions that I made during the process of uh, scripting and also decisions that I made, say, a long time ago. I mean, not that <laughs> earlier this year. Um, and like Leslie was saying, back then because it was live, so it was really coming from a very different point of view. So in the end, it was really very much about how do I redirect these ideas back to a form that uh, will be experienced over the screen, over the internet. Um, So I guess it was more about trying to, on the narrative level, it was trying to build up to something bigger. Uh, And also for Kopa Kun's play, I think it was chapter 15. 14 or 15 so in total there's 16 chapters right so 14 or 15 he started to uh, craft this sort of fantastical story about how during a storm uh, Zheng He's Amada found this uh, imaginary island that was created by Buddha's tears and then the the people on the island are like sons of Panku and Adam so it's you know even in the script itself, he was already trying to uh, very uh, drastically contrast different sort of cultural, uh, religious influences. Almost. almost like in a syncretic way. Yeah, yeah and, and I think on the overall level, we, we understand that we, we sort of, uh, we, can, we, can, we can sort of sympathize with this clash of, of, of ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to see in in words, it looks quite absurd, and I and, and I loved it. Mm. So I think it was really inspired by this idea of putting things together intentionally on a very sort of conf- uh, that that I know will conflict one another. But then, uh, then it becomes also very exciting for me on the editing level how I can 
bring them together harmoniously. Um, so, yes, on, on the on the audio level that is taking place, also on the visual level, how I can sort of, for example, me choosing to shoot it at a green screen, and then not really using the green screen for its function, but more as a kind of backdrop, and how then, like. Uh, green is a direct sort of uh, opposite of the orange that we see in the Rotunda library. So again, it was coming back to this idea of putting opposite ends together and try to find a way uh, to work together. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so that's really interesting. So let's, let's move towards speaking a bit about the, um, your choice of um, location settings. Also, you're working with um, green screen. So... Um, You've always kind of worked with this kind of chroma key effects in all your work, but it's just a matter of whether or not the green screen is visible or not. So you spoke about this before, and you said that this is one of the, perhaps the first time that you made it so evident in, in your work. Um, could you speak more about why you decided to make this decision? And then after that, um, perhaps continue a little bit more along um, the line that you started, which is like a, the rotunda as a kind of a contrast to this uh, green screen setting. I think um, in the last uh, maybe seven, eight years or so, there has been this sort of exponential growth in um, in the, the gaming scene. So, if you have, if you don't know, I, I, I game quite a lot. So, I, I'm familiar with the kind of uh, gadgets that is appearing, and and somehow in the last sort of ten years or so. Uh, the idea to game is shifting from a kind of immersive experience in this virtual world to a sort of performativity of gamers, performativity mm. of gaming itself. Oh, the gaming body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the gaming body. Who, mm. who games and who is who is uh, representative of of someone who games. Mm. So then. Uh, so, like for example, the keyboard that I use is this so-called RGB keyboard. Literally, it's a keyboard with 16 million uh, color options, lighting the keyboard. So, to me, that was another moment of like absurdity that I've been seeing. That I think is echoing what is happening to the world today, whereby we are shifting from a sort of immersion in something to a very distant performativity of something. And I think I, w- I really wanted to uh, adopt it, not adopt it, but to, to address it in, in, in my work somehow. And because, uh, as you mentioned, I, I've used the green screen quite a little bit uh, in my earlier works, and usually I, I will take out the green to, to change it to something else. But this time around, I really wanted, I really saw the green screen not so much as a immersed, uh, a video tool, but rather the green is now performed. You know, like there's this uh, second sort of distance of performing this green screen, performing this sense of uh, of being video, of being virtual, of being uh, within the video plane. Um, and yeah, so I I just thought, you know, this whole idea of kind of having the medium being a little bit more reflexive about itself can become quite interesting if we were to read it um, based on the kind of um, phenomenon that we are seeing today like how I have a friend who whose brother is like 10 years old and he has this green screen or or rather this uh, YouTube studio in his room and he's already recording YouTube videos at that tender age and what it means to understand all these video techniques or video or, or rather the the, the 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 use of the medium itself you know mm. uh, I think it's something that intrigues me quite a bit mm. yeah so I think um, again to reflect on the current climate of things I feel that uh, typing or at least if I were to see typing as a language then it is the language of communication today. Like, whether it's typing on the internet or typing on our WhatsApp, you know, it's, it becomes this 
moments whereby sometimes we have to be careful, even the way we 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 type because the way words are being uh, read in someone else's mind can be very different. So I'm sure we all experience that. Mm. So I really thought of using typing as being quite representative of these moments that I experience. And again, coming back to the keyboard, you know how it was. Uh, coincidental that uh, Georgette Chen's um, mechanical typing keyboard is right in the center of the table and how again in this gaming sort of world people are shifting from the more sort of advanced um, uh, mechanics of softer and and smaller typing keys to this kind of retrofitting mechanical movements in the, uh, the keyboard now so now all the keyboards are mechanical. It's almost like we have gone one big round to come back to a technology that was from before, and we are and and it and this more retro technology has enabled this idea of the performativity again. So the typing becomes much louder and much punchier, mm. and it's not about what you're typing anymore. It's about how nice the typing experience is almost yeah the, the way that you introduced the almost diegetic sound was very interesting because you can tell when you're typing the same key over and over again it sounds the same so somehow it resonates with like the music and sounds that um, Leslie has um, produced in a very um, clashing way at the same time there's an odd kind of harmony to it mm. yeah. yeah I think definitely yeah um, the, the contrast between this very ambient, uh, melodic sound that has been produced by Leslie and even the fluid movements of Tsai Ying acting within the frame um, are really pitched against this very hard contrast of the typing which almost sounds violent. Yeah, mm. I think I'm, I'm glad you brought up the word violent because I think the word I will use more is ang angry. Mm. So okay. it almost mm. sounds angry. Mm. And I, again, it goes back to trying to really encompass a wide range of um, very complex uh, sentiments and feelings and emotions that is really a, a, a deep mixture of, of um, contemplativeness, of regret, of anger, of frustration, of um, hopefulness as well. You know, and then it's all kind of putting them together in this very complex mood of the day mm. of today and I think a lot of it is me trying to firstly recreate this mood and also then to examine it in my work mm. yeah. I think that really brings out also these more hidden um, tones um, or even elusive um, inclinations of Kuo Pao Kun's play where you know the tale sounds very playful, you know, particularly, for example, the line that ends with, you know, aren't we all just like a bunch of pricks, for example. So that that kind of introduction of anger, I think, can read dif so differently, I think, from the, um, a lot of how the play might register generally. But I think it's a really nice way for you to surface, you know, um, these undercurrents that in fact, are not even undercurrents in our contemporary, you know, media scape, but are very much at the foreground, you know, of how how um, emotions are actually being articulated online, you know, in the online space. Could you then speak about um, a kind of key motif uh, in the work that appears quite early on? It's a kind of a triangular shape, and then at the end, you see it appear again. Um, in terms of like a kind of flock of little triangles that fade out as Leslie's um, singing closes off the work. So it looks on one hand, as we had spoken before, like a kind of navigational system, but it could also be a little bit phallic um, shaped or it could signify change, you know, and the symbol for change and so on. So um, what did that symbol mean to you and why did you decide to close the work this way? So I think when I was again at the um, at the scripting stage, I felt that um, coming from a very sort of uh, a film perspective, I needed a mom I needed moments within the work to 
to really drive home the uh, contemplative nature of the text and of uh, Leslie's music as well. So, um, and because the whole play is sort of condensed into this 30 minutes, it can feel a little bit lopsided in terms of content and, and intensity. And I, I, I needed more things that can uh, uh, balance it out. So I was just looking around online and I came across this um, animation. I, I just re couldn't recall the name of the animator, but uh, this animation of um, of this almost um, galaxy-like movement of pixels. And then from there, it led me to research about this um, this history of trying to recreate uh, uh, animal movements in, in, in computer, in animation. So they call this the BOID, which stands for birds and flocking movement and I think some, something, something along that line. So then I, and what's, what's more interesting is that, you know, in this sort of, in this line of code, I can change various values and therefore change the way uh, a group will behave in a group. So if I were to say increase the distance of attraction, suddenly it will resemble, you know, the, the scene of like a, literally a, a, a flock of uh, a, a swallows, right, flying, it's the kind of organic shapes that's been created or I can reduce the, uh, the distance and it can literally become just a scene at the intersection at let's say a very busy uh, subway station so then that, then that moment of me trying to find the exact spot of attractiveness and interaction was also very for me very rewarding so I managed to find this sweet spot where the people are sort of moving together in the same direction, but there is also this tendency for them to sway off into another direction. Mm. And somehow, with this change in direction, the other people started to follow as well. So it became this moment where everyone is trying to look for their own direction, but somehow we are still almost relying relying on certain unity of the of the group to find this direction. And I thought that was like the perfect moment to in a way sum up what I was trying to do and also visually then it is very busy but we don't really need to uh, invest so much uh, uh, concentration on it it was just something playing and then with Leslie's song and with whatever that followed uh, before I just thought it was a perfect moment to close um, the film so then if I were to work backwards, if I put that scene at the back, I need to address this this symbol somewhere in the in the front. So uh, I start in a way I introduce uh, to my section with this diminishing um, triangle, and then again then combining with this RGB lighting that came from the keyboard to really talk about this sense of. Um, spectrum, the sense of differences, the, span, uh, the, the and how then all this actually, if you look at it on a sort of macro level, are just individuals all trying to find directions for one another. Mm. So I thought it was a very sort of uh, apt uh, moment for me to include in the film. Yeah, I think, thanks Kri, I think, I think thinking about the green screen you know, uh, within this kind of gaming cache, it has quite a loaded significance in the sense that it reflects, you know, um, changing kind of trends you know, about um, the way in which performativity is is articulated. So I'm, I'm now very curious about how Leslie and Tsai Ying felt when you had to perform in front of the green screen because both of your backgrounds, I think, involve you're uh, coming from a very specific stage, you know, uh, tradition in the way when it comes to live music or, or even dance, where, um, you know, lighting, um, the acoustics, these are all controlled variables and most often it seems to take place in a kind of a black box or at the very least a kind of a studio 
So what was it like to kind of be transported or transplanted into this green environment, which, you know, to me, it suggests a kind of almost like a technological neutrality, but, you know, in Cray's vision, maybe actually he's referencing something quite specific in terms of the performing body almost being detached and um, flattened, you know, into its own performance. Yeah. I, I was just trying to hit all my cues. <laughs> <laughs> Acting is not my, like, you know, forte, but yeah, basically I've been filmed in all sorts of environments. This was another interesting one. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I mean, the idea is, it's, it's uh, definitely, like, intriguing in that mm. sense. And, I have been involved previously before in like behind the camera kind of work, so mm. so it's not in, in a sense surprising, but being there, getting filmed, yeah, you know. But I was just trying not to <laughs> not to be distracted. <laughs> well, well, the way you threw the leaves of the book was very rhythmic. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was just in the editing, it was in the, in the way it was done. So yeah, I felt that, like, ooh, it, you hit the beach. Yeah, <laughs> was, that, was, that was orchestrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By the director, the maestro. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, continuing along the lines of what Tsai is saying, like, I think Tsai you had a very important sequence where, I mean, two actually, um, where you were kind of performing as, as yourself in the white garb. Um, and then for a second, Cray's made up face, face that's made up in operatic uh, makeup appears for a second on this green screen. And then you're playing another kind of character that seems different from the character that you play when you're in the um, full costume in the rotunda. So um, maybe you could speak a little bit about how you understand the difference between these two characters. And then after that, I suppose we can also talk about the, the significant scene where, you know, Cray was inspired by Peter Campus's work and your makeup is kind of taken off to remove, uh, uh, it's removed to sort of reveal a face underneath. Um, yeah, but first, uh, your, the difference between the green screen um, movements, that sequence, and your um, operatic segment in the rotunda. So it's a green studio, uh, green screen studio. Uh,其实也一开始的想法也是,呃,从,呃,Cray给的,因为他希望,呃,比如在,我,我们有服装,有化妆的那段是非常传统的身段,然后非常传统的一段戏曲的一个那样的表演的感觉。然后在, 像一种更用当代的方法去或者是现代舞的一个或者我们这么说不是传统身段的 呃，动作出现在一个非常好像现代的一个身体里面，所以在green uh, screen 呃 uh, green screen studio 的时候，那一段 movement 基本上的概念是这样子的，对，然后有服装的那有服装有有有有化妆的那段就是希望保持非常非常。so maybe I think Craig can speak a little yeah. bit about this, but why you chose to use this particular um, kind of compositing technique that you said you were inspired by Peter Campus's work, Three Transitions. Mm. I think for me it's, it's just this um, nerdy moment that I have whereby I, I pay homage to the sort of people that I have that have inspired me. Um, but I think when I was uh, conceiving the whole idea of, um, I think from the very beginning we talk about, we need to have this uh, moment where she is putting on the makeup, where she's putting on also the, she's donning the, this costume. Can it be, uh, can it be important? But at the same time, can it also become quite cliche, you know, like 
literally putting on these traditions and putting on all this burden on yourself. So then I really had to find a way to do it more poetically without, you know, endangering that moment to become quite cliche almost. So, uh, and then just this one <laughs> fun day, I, I thought, okay, maybe these two ideas come together. So instead of putting on the makeup, now you're actually removing something about yourself to reveal something underneath. So mm. I guess the, the gist of the process is... Is that? <laughs> no, I thought it was really wonderful how it tied in with the themes of the play that you know all three of you speak other lines for at the end about um, coming to a kind of an island, a Shiwai Taoyuan, where people have something that's within themselves that allows themselves to be governed in that sense. So it's almost like I, I kind of read the costume, the putting on the costume and the kind of like taking off your, off your face to reveal the operatic makeup within to also allude to the same idea. And the fact that you appear in this kind of makeup and tying does as well. And there's also overlap in between, uh, between yours and Leslie's costumes. It's really interesting. So I think the, the way that it layered, it's, it's, um, it brings out the themes of the, the play quite well. So um, could you speak uh, about the use of the rotunda as a, uh, as a kind of a shooting location? For me, uh, when, I, when I was first looking for a location, I think I needed a more sort of, or rather I'm, I'm more comfortable or more familiar with a controlled environment, so like an interior space. And, um, you know, as much as NGS has, has a lot of beautiful sort of um, areas, um, I, I randomly thought of the, the dome, the, li- the, the Rotunda Library, and I thought how uh, it was so theatrical. Like, I think at one moment, even when conceiving the live performance, we were thinking about performing in it, whereby then the viewers get to stand on the second level, almost like a circle seat, and then the performance happened on the first level. So then I think this whole theatrical sort of nature of the space really spoke to me. Uh, and then, of course, it was also this idea that, you know, to, I needed something to, to really contrast with the green screen. And I just thought that the library is this, um, it really represented this whole sort of uh, neo-colonial <laughs> representation of history, right? And uh, and in terms of the furnishing, the, the colours, it, it, it is beautiful on its own. And, and I don't know why maybe I, I, I do get a sense that I, or rather I am, I feel like I have to be a little bit guilty about appreciating this kind of beauty. So I think a lot of it has to do with this kind of uh, back and forth uh, negotiation. And ultimately, I think also due to practical reasons, like I, like I said, a more controlled environment, I just decided it would be the best uh, place to control the sound, control the lighting. Yeah. But did it also kind of govern the way that you chose to shoot the key scenes at the end where there's literally a revolution around and you actually name the different um, segments in your own script revolution one, two, three and so on. Yeah, so I think uh, naturally when I was in this space, I I, I instinctively re- uh, responded to the uh, the circular nature of, of the, the pathways and I think even when I'm discussing the dance or, or the movements with, with Tai Ying, naturally we, we, we have to think about how do you move in mm. this circular manner. So I think right from the beginning, um, uh, uh, responding actively to the, to the architecture has always been quite important. And also I think on a sort of practical level, it is quite impossible to find um, interesting flat angles, flat, flat views, because uh, the library has so many lines of symmetry that literally everywhere you turn to, it's the same view mm. almost. So then it was, yeah, it was almost pushing us to think about, okay, I think also for Nelson, the, the, the cinematographer and Lincoln, is for them, 
quite uh, fun to think about how they can shoot something based on our very uh, 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 humble budget. Like, how can we also do something quite interesting with with, with the three sixty panning? Um, so I think it was it was it was an experiment for all of us involved mm-hmm. like, to, to to really respond to the the library space. Right. So how much of the kind of meaning making in terms of the revolutions came about through the blocking that you did on site that day when you were filming or does it come through in the editing process? I think um, when I'm scripting I already very vividly try to uh, envision what's going to happen and we did some tests at home uh, so like even when we were rehearsing at the substation we were placed the chairs yeah. <laughs> inside the dance studio to, <laughs> to recreate the, the space. Mm-hmm. So we already have some kind of expectations of how it would look. Mm-hmm. And I think on the day itself when we were actually seeing it, it became, it, it, it just sort of, it took over in terms of uh, wanting to go for it because it was very painterly, the image that happened. It, it was almost like, looking at uh, Chua Miyati's painting almost where the, the, the characters are all sort of nicely composed if like we were just standing around the table and it already looked like a kind of painting that is going to be unfolded so that moment itself was enough to sort of convince me to go out, go out for it and I think on the spot we improvised certain movements and certain sort of timings mm. and and now I'm having a lot of problems in the editing room <laughs> because so many things are difficult to sort of uh, stitch together. But it's okay, we will get there. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think the whole point of it was also to push what we can do with the medium as well. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, I think how you've approached the kind of very circular, you know, symmetric, symmetrical architecture of the rotunda is also quite interesting in, you know, the, the kind of... Uh, cuts in process now um, because actually you know this idea of the camera performing the revolution or you know creating a swivel I mean it also brings to mind this idea of you know the panopticon as always constantly surveying you know everything in its surroundings but in fact what happens in the production is that the characters often kind of enter and exit a quadrant or move through two of the four quadrants um, or are stationary, so it gives that sense that not everything is also captured by this so-called, you know, technology and, and surveillance. So I, I think I really agree with you that it takes on almost like a painterly, more more um, impressionistic quality, mm. and that really is something that is also enabled by yeah the editing process of, of cinema. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for your participation today in the Artist Tour and we really appreciate you, Cray, Leslie and Tsai Ying for being here and speaking about this work with us and congratulations on the really fine work and um, we hope that it sees um, many more audiences. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.